Hello and welcome back to EHC TV. My name is Omar Massenberg. And I'm Tatum Harville. And I'll be doing your news interview for today. And I'll be doing your sports interview for today. Tatum, have you heard about the end of the basketball season? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, today we have Patrick Antonelli here talking about his season and all that they've been into and what they're looking forward to. So it's going to be great. Ooh, cannot wait to hear. Absolutely. And with spring break coming up and springtime in general, there's a lot, lots of cool, really, really neat climate collaborative things going on. Have you heard anything about that? Interesting you say so, because I have the president, Claire Carter, coming in today to discuss some things they've, they've been planning. Awesome. I look forward to hearing from that from her. And I can't wait to hear about Patrick. Thank you, Omar. We'll listen to your interview with Claire and can't wait to hear what she has to say. Hello, today I'll be interviewing Climate Collaborative member Claire Carter. And today we'll be discussing their newest venture into installing solar panels on campus. Welcome, Claire. Hi, Claire. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? So just give us a little bit, um, so what is Climate Collaborative? Yeah, so the Emory Climate Collaborative is an environmental group um, previously known as the Greens. Um, in, uh, before I came to Emory, they were known as that. Um, I'm the president of the group, and it's just, it, it's, a, it's a group of students, faculty, um, and then uh, occasionally community members have been involved, and we work to make Emory and Henry a greener place, and we've had um, a few initiatives over the years to to try to do that so yeah that's that's basically what we are okay how long have you been a member of climate collaborative so i've been a member as long as i've been at emory um i came i'm a transfer student so i came in my sophomore year and i um have been a member ever since then but uh i became president um this is my second year being president so i became president like right at the beginning of the pandemic which was interesting <laughs> were there other groups you were a part of before joining climate collaborative or is this your first time I'm trying to think, um, like in terms of environmental groups or just yeah, in general? just in terms of environmental oh, okay. groups. Have yeah, you yeah, yeah. Anymore? Um, yeah, so when I was in high school, I started the environmental club at my high school. Um, mm -hmm. So we, it was actually similar to the Emory Climber Collaborative in that we like did a lot of initiatives like um, recycling and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was a really cool project that I did. In terms of like other groups that I've been a part of, I've, already, I've always been um, interested in the environment. Uh, the, um, the local AmeriCorps chapter where I grew up kind of partnered with our environmental group from high school, so that was interesting. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, it does perfectly. What, other, what was the biggest initiative you'd done before joining Climate Collaborative? Probably the biggest thing that I did. Hmm, or you were a part of. That, yeah. Um, well, I think the, the thing that I'm most proud of that I did in the environmental group in high school, you're talking about like before climate collaborative, yes, right? Yeah. Um, so the biggest thing I did in high school was when I was a senior, I organized this big um, event called the Environmental Fest. And um, it was, uh, we had like vendors and we had food and music and activities and people from the high school came out and people from the community came out and um, we planted trees and we had like an invasive species removal um, and it was ultimately a fundraiser for um, the environmental group in town um, and, we and we raised like over $500. So that was, um, that was something that I was really proud of in high school and I, I look back on it and I'm still very proud of it. Following that success, is that kind of why you wanted to install solar panels, just to get another success on campus? Yeah, so the solar panels kind of came out of a conversation that I had been having kind of in tandem with um, Dr. Ed Davis, our advisor. Um, and we've been having it, the, the group has been having that conversation with the administration of Emory and Henry for a few years. Um, and. Um, it's, it's not that there's been pushback. I think that everybody wants to have renewable energy on campus. It's just like, we don't want to spend too much money up front. You know, like it's, we want to focus on, um, like getting the money from that, that we can from like new students, and, which is why a lot of, I think, and I'm speculating here, why a lot of like, um, focus has been put on like housing instead of like renewable energy to, because you know like we we want to be cautious with like how money is coming in but um the solar panels this semester really stemmed from um kind of a hopeful conversation that we had with the administration about um 
like wanting to maybe install some solar panels like on the ground, whereas um, before we were more pushing for like on buildings, and that mm -hmm. was kind of where a lot of pushback came from. But on like on land, not on buildings, it seemed um, it seemed like that was going to be a lot more plausible. So we're trying to get support from the students right now, which is why we have a petition for it. You said something about renewable energy. And I was wondering, were there other options that you had besides solar, solar panels when you were doing this? I wish, no. <laughs> yeah, no, um, because uh, it's, it's not windy enough to have wind turbines. In fact, there was a guy a few years ago or a year ago or something like that that offered to buy a wind turbine for campus, but ultimately it, it would have been kind of embarrassing because like, it would have never, it would have never... Uh, mm -hmm generated any energy because we don't we, it's not like we live on the west coast yeah. you know, where it's like flat or something it, it wouldn't have worked and we don't have like hydraulic power um so solar panels is really like the way to go what like aspect are you trying to really focus on with solar panels is it electricity just trying to get more money for it you know yeah where are you, where are you leaning on that one yeah so definitely um definitely electricity to power buildings on campus um ultimately we want we i mean our ultimate goal would to be would be to have as much covered on campus as possible um we'll see like exact like i i think it's better to like dream really big and then whittle it down when um when like roadblocks come in the way but mm -hmm. that's i mean that's the ultimate goal to have as much covered by renewable energy as possible i mean like non-renewable energy sources are just going to get more expensive it's ultimately a good uh a good thing to do financially and um environmentally to go a more renewable route out of all the methods you use to try and get solar panels on campus, why petitioning? You could have spread it on social media, maybe try and get the younger audience or the people you're trying to attract, the new students. Mm -hmm. you know, what was for the reason for petitioning? Yeah, so um, we discussed a couple of ideas in the group, like how we would get like a petition out, and social media was one thing that we talked about. Um, I think that we've just had some more success in the past with like being in person, asking for if you, like people might have seen us in the CAF or in MS, um, like asking for signatures on petitions. And it's just, it's just more successful. I mean, like social media, I think, is, is a really good tool to get the word out mm -hmm. um, for like events. But in terms of like you need people to actually like do things, like sign a petition, it's, it's a lot easier if you go face to face and be like, hey, here's a pencil, put your name down. It's just, we've just found it to be a lot more effective. Have you found new members that wanted to join Climate Collaborative through this way of petitioning? Yeah, um, I don't know, maybe. Uh, if anybody wants to join Climate Collaborative, of course. let me know. <laughs> How many signatures did you get? Uh, right now we have over 200. Over 200? So everyone's going for the, the solar panels. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be a really popular idea. Besides solar panels, what other ideas have y'all had for, as a group to try and bring on the campus? Yeah, so... Um, as some people may know, recycling isn't something that like the county does anymore, and that's and that's you know not really the county's control. It's like a lot of bigger issues surrounding that. But um, we still do aluminum recycling on campus, which I don't think that a lot of people realize. It's collected at the uh, the train depot, mm -hmm. um, kind of. Uh, it's now campus police um, uh, offices. But last year we did an aluminum can drive like in the residence halls and it was kind of like a competition so that was really successful because you know you use a can and then but there's not a recycling place for paper so you just like don't assume that there's a recycling place for aluminum so you just throw the aluminum can away mm -hmm. and that is just that's the worst thing you can do for an, for an aluminum can because it takes so much more energy to produce aluminum than it does to produce plastic and if you don't then recycle that aluminum you're not you're you're just you're hurting the environment more than you would be to be using plastic and then throwing it away if you use aluminum and then throw it away so really the best thing that you can do for aluminum cans on this campus is recycle it um and so that's kind of what we tried to do with that drive and i think mm -hmm. that it was very successful as well to other passionate people who are going to watch this and want to join and help where can they find these collab climate collaborative meetings? Yeah, so we meet um, every Sunday at 5 p.m. Um, and it's fun. We like we bring uh, we bring food sometimes, and it's just it's a great group of people. Um, so yeah, the meetings are usually an hour, and um, it's every week to every other week, depending on like how intense the project that we're doing is. Right now, we're, we're meeting every week, um, but. If you, I mean, if you just search my email in the in the um, EHC search email search engine, um, mm -hmm. I come up, 
I'm happy to add people to the email list. We have, um, we have like over 80 people on the email list right now, and it says it has all the information about um, meeting times, um, event times, all that stuff. We also we also have an Instagram. Just search Emory Climate Collaborative in Instagram, and you'll see that. Well, thank you, Claire, for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much. If you have any more questions or want to know any more about Climate Collaborative, please reach out to Claire. Her email is on the page, or you can just follow the Climate Collaborative Instagram page. Thank you. And this was your news interview for the week. Good afternoon, and welcome to EHC TV Sports. I'm your host, Anthony Smith, Jr. And this past week, we had a momentous occasion when the men's and women's basketball teams held their senior day games. Both teams were on the Bob Johnson court inside of the King Center playing their last home game, which also happened to be the last game of the season for both teams. The women's team held their game first versus Carolina University, so let's start by taking a look at their highlights. The team was celebrating Alexis Hoppers, Callie Hatterer, and Claudia Frost as they were playing their last games as Emory and Henry Wasps. So when the game started, it was only right for senior Callie Hatterer to get the offense going by hitting a big time three to get the game started in the right direction. Hatterer finished with 15 points, leading all scoring for the Wasps. On the next offensive possession, a fumbled handoff led to a steal for the Bruins. And off the steal, she outran the defense and finished the fast break with a layup on the other end of the floor. But the Wasps didn't let the turnover get them down as they pulled away late in this one and finished with a final score of 71 to 54, sending the seniors off with one final hurrah. On the men's side, we saw Micah Banks as well as manager Jordan Grant be recognized for senior day prior to tip-off. The men's team was also taking on Carolina University in their final game and came out looking for blood. And a hard jab set by Michael Morgan gives them an easy pass to the basket for two points. On defense, a swat at the pass puts the ball on the ground, but the Bruins are able to maintain possession and kick the ball out for a three-point shot. The Wasps then called a timeout to draw up a game plan in order to score on offense inside the paint. And on the very next possession, Kevin Rodriguez uses his athletic system to put up a very acrobatic layup on the bigger defender. And then we see Kay Looney working his magic in the low post with a skyhook for another two points for the Wasps. With all the offensive outpour from the Wasps, they were unable to come out of this one with a win as the final score was 73-69 to in favor of the Carolina Bruins. This week we'll have the baseball team holding a doubleheader on Tuesday, March 1st against Montreat with the first game at 1.30 and the following game taking place at 4 o'clock. And for those who will be here this weekend, there will be a men's and women's tennis match against Maryville starting at 1 o'clock. So make sure you come out and show your support for our sports teams this week. And with that, we have come to an end of this week's sports update. For EHC TV, I'm Anthony Smith, Jr. Hey, y'all. I'm Tatum Harvel, and I'll be doing your ENH sports interview. The basketball team is just finishing off their season after facing Carolina University over the weekend. The Wasps have ended with a 16-10 winning record. Being their first season facing Division II rivals, the Wasps are making great headway. And joining us from the team, we have sophomore guard Patrick Ananelli. Patrick, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And so, Patrick, after winning in your all's first matchup, the team took a close 73-69 to loss to Carolina University to end the season on Saturday. And although the cards weren't in your all's favor, the team still battled it out to the very end. And Patrick, win or lose, how have you seen this grit and drive play out for your team all throughout the season? You know, we showed a lot of effort and intensity during the last game. We've had a lot of adversity the entire year. We've had injuries, illness, players leave the team. And the last game, it was good to go out with all we had. You know, there was nothing else we could do. It was our last game. Had to give 100% effort. And I was just proud of everyone on the team for the effort they showed. Yeah. And so as a team, when we talk about this grit and drive that you all have shown all throughout the season, it's boasted you a 16 to 10 winning record with your first time facing Division II competition. And as someone who has seen the Division III side of this game as well, was that expected? Based off of last year, I would assume a lot of people did not think we'd go 16 and 10 this year. But internally in the locker room, I think we, all the coaching staff, all the players thought we would have a great season this year. And Thankfully, we did. It was a very fun season, and I was, I'm very happy that we came out 16 and 10. Obviously, we could have done a lot better, but that's just how it goes sometimes. Absolutely. And as a leader and player on the court, has the move to Division II intimidated you or your skill set at all? 
Not really, because I always try to prepare to be the best I can be and prepare for the highest level. And the move to D2 was a very fun move for uh, the whole team. I mean, the D3 rules and D2 rules in the NCAA are completely different. We can work out sooner with the coaches and everything. And in D3, we wouldn't be able to see the coaches until maybe two or three months into the school year. And now we can see them in the very first month. So we've all worked very hard to be able to make this transition a lot easier. Yeah. And when you talk about preparing at the highest level that you possibly can, as a player that's went from D3 to D2, have you changed how you prepare any for the game to compete at a higher level? And what does that look like for you? I have changed a little bit of the way I prepare. I have to be a lot smarter because a lot of the players are a lot better at D2 than D3. So the way you play changes. You might not be able to do some things you were able to do at D3 uh, that you can in D2. So. It's just a lot of thinking and trying to be smart while on the court. Yeah. And as you look at that from a team perspective, what were some of the biggest challenges that you all faced this season with new competition? Like I said before, the, a lot of the players in D2 are a lot bigger and stronger and a lot better. So it, it was, that's mainly the big difference between D3 and D2. It's not so much uh, their skill set. It's mainly just how big they are. Yeah. Everyone is a lot bigger and faster. And that was a big adjustment for everyone on our team. How do you think your team maybe overcame that intimidation factor that came with the new transition? I think it was a lot to do with the coaching staff. They prepared us uh, well enough to be able to perform highly in the games. And they told us leading up to the games and stuff, this team's going to be very fast, very big. It's going to be a lot different than last year. And I think we all understood that and went out and tried to compete with them. Yeah, absolutely. And so with this transition, you all have tried to hone in on, your, on, your, on what you're so good at and be able to perform at the best level that you possibly can. So my next question is a fill in the blank question. So fill in the blank, as a team, we are at our best when we do blank. When we're playing together and having fun. You know, there's a, when you're not playing together as a team and you're not having fun, it's just not very good to watch. Like if you're a fan, you can just tell that it's, they're not playing well. And when we're moving the ball, it, it's it's a lot of fun to watch. I mean, if you've seen some of our games, we're a very fast-paced, high-scoring team. So we just like to run, run, and score. And that's what we did this year. Absolutely. So, Patrick, this is my last question. But as someone who may be a young player on this team, but has such a love and leadership role for this program, where do you hope to leave Emory & Henry basketball when you graduate? I hope that I can leave it as one of the top programs in the SAC conference. And that might be very difficult because the SAC is one of the best Division II basketball conferences in the country. But the only thing we can try to do is try to do as best as we can for the players coming up so that way they have it easier than we did. Absolutely. And thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for being here with us today. And congratulations on your season. We'll be so excited to watch you all play again next season. Thank you. And thank you so much. This concludes our sports interview for EHC TV. I'm Tatum Harville, and we'll see you all next week. Well, Tatum, that was a really good interview. I'm glad to know that transferring into D2 hasn't affected our team at all. Absolutely. I think it's so cool that the basketball team has been able to keep a winning record even though they've been facing tougher com competition. And Patrick really honed in on the fact that the team gels really well together and they stick up for each other and they make sure that no matter what they're facing, they do it together and they do it to the best of their ability. So I love that we were able to hear from his perspective and what they've been doing as a whole to get where they are today. You too. Another guest phenomenal that you have. Yeah, and I really loved hearing from Claire and everything that they're doing with the Climate Collaborative. I think it's so cool that there's so many amazing opportunities for people to get involved around campus if they want to. And I'm just so excited to see that grow and to hear from the passion that she has and the passion that she really pours into other people to be able to give back as well. Um, I know Claire will appreciate your words, what you just said. Another two wonderful interviews this week. My name is Omar Massenberg. And I'm Tatum Harville, and we will see you all as soon as we get back from spring break. Y'all have fun. Be safe. Bye.